Do you want to instill a sense of calm or excitement? Each of you is working towards the goal of helping your dog overcome his fear of something. And we've talked about how we can help our dogs develop an emotional response that is pleasant rather than fearful in the presence of the scary thing. And we'll be doing this by employing counter conditioning techniques. That much we know. What we need to decide now is what kind of pleasant response are we hoping to create? Do we want our dogs to feel zen and relaxed? Or do we want him to feel excited and energetic? Either of these are considered pleasant, but depending on the context, it may be more useful for your dog to feel one or the other, either calm or energized. For example, if your goal is for your dog to no longer be afraid of getting his nails trimmed, it might be more practical to create a calm and relaxed emotional response to the grooming context. It would be quite a challenge to rev your dog up with a lively game of tug and then try to clip his nails. If, on the other hand, what you're aiming for is to help your dog overcome fear of the space where you practice agility, well, it might be more practical to create a happy and energetic emotional response to the practice facility. And doing so would more easily lead to the energetic alert behavior that you'll need in that context. So keep this in mind as you consider the work ahead of you. Will you want your dog to be chillaxed or playful and alert? And there's no right or wrong answer here. It's up to you to decide what might be best according to the, the type of fear that you'll be working on. In the most recent practical exercise, you began developing your mechanical skills by focusing on the sequence of events. You made the first stimulus appear and you followed up immediately with a second stimulus, which in this case was food. Now that we understand the importance of the sequence of events, we're going to turn our attention to that second stimulus. It's this second stimulus that will influence what type of involuntary response we're creating in the presence of the first stimulus. In the recent practice exercise, we use food as the second stimulus. And with tons of repetition, your dog should have begun to anticipate the appearance of food when he noticed that first stimulus. In my video example, it was Ice tray equals food is coming. If you're successful at creating association through classical conditioning, your dog may begin to salivate, not outright drool, but his mouth may begin to water in anticipation of food when he sees the first stimulus appear. It was previously a neutral stimulus, but you've been pairing it with food. That's pretty cool. Now, how you move will affect the exercise. If you'd like to instill a feeling of calm in the presence of a stimulus, keep your movements soft and fluid instead of quick and jerky. If your dog tends to become more excited in the presence of food, consider pairing the neutral object with something that is more likely to help your dog feel calm, like maybe gently stroking his chest, if, if this is something that he likes, of course. If he doesn't like being touched, then it, it won't feel very relaxing. To instill a calm response. Now here's an example of the type of interaction that my late dog Chili used to love. You know, when I touched her like this, her breathing would slow down, her eyelids would get heavy, and then sometimes she would sigh. If I had wanted to help her feel this way in the presence of an object like the ice tray, I might have placed the ice tray close by where she could see it and then proceeded to massage her this way for several minutes. Then I would have removed the ice tray and ended the massage session. For every future massage sessions, I would have employed the same sequence of events, placed the ice tray where she could see it, and then proceed with a massage. And when the object reappears, and every time it appears, so does the massage. And my movements, both while touching her and while placing and removing the ice tray, would have been slow and deliberate the environment would have been quiet and calming. If, on the other hand, the emotional response that I'm hoping to create involves a playful, more energetic mood, the exercise would look a little more like this demo video. Note that in order to stay inside the camera frame, I remain seated and, and our play area is quite small. And if it wasn't for the video, I, I'd have been far more animated and, and we'd have been moving around a lot more. So. Here, I place a pitcher on the floor where Benny can see it, and then I entice him to engage and play with me while still in the presence of the pitcher. When I remove the pitcher, the game stops. 
and when I put the picture back, the game starts again. Now watch Benny closely. In the beginning, the pitcher has no significance to him. He sees it, but it doesn't mean anything to him. And when I remove the pitcher and I stop playing with him, he tries to offer behaviors that may have worked in the past, like lying down, for example. And after a few repetitions of my placing the pitcher on the floor and initiating play, you'll notice Benny's demeanor begin to change when he sees the pitcher. And it doesn't take long for him to figure out that pitcher equals playtime regardless of what he does. With lots and lots of repetition over many sessions, the mere presence of the pitcher should trigger a feeling of happy excitement in Benny, which is a, an involuntary response, even if I'm not playing with him. And note that I, I could have also chosen to simply place the pitcher one time in a location where Benny could see it and then started an animated play session without that constant start and stop. But I did it this way with, with the start and stop to highlight the mechanics, the timing, and the sequence of events. Now, Hopefully, even with the restraint shown in the video, you'll understand what I'm trying to illustrate. Remember, during these exercises, we're focused on how our dog feels, not on what he does. And what I mean by this, of course, is that we're not asking our dog to do any specific behaviors during this time. No sit or down or stay or anything like that. And I appreciate that we can't possibly know what the dog is feeling or thinking, but what we can do is try our best to interpret his behavior and that should give us some insight into his emotional state. So with lots of repetition, doing many, many sessions using the same exercise, the sight of the object that you're using, like the ice tray from the first video on practicing mechanics, or the pitcher from the video in this lesson, should eventually lead to an emotional response in your dog, even if there is no massage, no food, and no playtime available. Just the presence of the object should trigger this new emotional response that you've been instilling through association. Okay, now for a super important note. Do not use the actual scary thing to practice this exercise because we haven't yet talked about the desensitization portion of the exercise. How close your dog is to the scary thing will be very significant, so please don't skip ahead and pull out the scary thing just yet. Continue to use a neutral object to practice your mechanics. Now, here's your assignment. Practice your mechanics using a different neutral stimulus than the one that you used in the first practice session. That means pick a new object that means nothing to your dog and pair it with something other than food. And this isn't easy, I know. I mean, you can choose either something calming, like stroking your dog gently, or doing something that you know is calming to your dog, whatever that may be, or something that elicits a more energetic, playful response. You don't need to do both types. You can just choose one for, for this assignment. If your dog doesn't enjoy being stroked or touched, then think of something else that might help him feel relaxed. And again, the goal is for that first neutral stimulus to eventually elicit the emotional response like calm or playful all on its own without the presence of a massage or food or play. And this would only happen after a ton of repetition, but here you'll have a chance to practice your mechanics. Take your time with this assignment. The aim is to help you get used to thinking outside the box to sharpen your creative problem solving skills. It sounds like a simple enough exercise, but it can leave us scratching our heads, especially if we're not used to working with things other than food.